Thank you so much for listening to Our People, Our Story, a Sioux Falls Connected podcast. Our guest today is Kevin Gans. He is the curator of the Old Courthouse Museum. Am I saying all that right? Yeah, you've got it right. Absolutely. Very, very good. Yes. And, uh, joining us as well, we have Garrett, uh, and he's been here. Garrett Gross has been here for each one of these uh, programs so far. So what what kind of cool stuff are we going to talk about today, Garrett? Well, I, I think uh, we've had several guests that are uh, uh, kind of amateur historians in the area here and uh you know everybody's got their level of expertise and level of knowledge and uh, those of us that kind of research things on our own time uh you know we we can only do so much but uh we've got somebody from the museum today who this is his job to do this research and his job to educate people on local history and uh either one of two things he's uh, uh, uh the expert in the area or people think he's the expert in the area <laughs> And both, I think, are uh, good for this. And just wanted to welcome my friend Kevin to the show today. And uh, there's a lot of material that we can share. Kind of uh, his expertise that, that I'm familiar with is in that similar time period. We talked in the last two shows from kind of 1850 time period to about 1910. And then we'll just hit that same time period from a different perspective. And we welcome Kevin to do just that. Very, very nice. Kevin, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. It's Are my you pleasure. originally from Sioux Falls? Absolutely not. No, I am a complete transplant uh, here to Sioux Falls. I grew up in the Finger Lakes region of western New York. Oh, wow. Uh, had never been to South Dakota before in my life. Um, How did you end up here? Well, that's the question I always get. It's like, why would anybody ever leave New York? Why no, would you not, come here to South Dakota? I'm not saying that. I'm glad nope. you're here, but well, how would you end up here? Well, uh, I came to college. I went to Augustana. Okay. And... Uh, uh, it's it's rather kind of interesting. I became interested in South Dakota because I was looking for colleges just at the time that the movie Dances with Wolves came out in theaters. Oh, yeah. And I saw the movie, and I'm like, look at that landscape. I'm like, just, it's amazing. I've always been very interested in Western history, and, you know, I'm like, wow, you could stand in a place out there, and you could turn around 360 degrees and not see any civilization anywhere. I'm like, I, I really want to check this out, and became very interested yeah. In in South Dakota, about two weeks later, I got a card in the mail from Augustana. Oh. I'm like, look, mom, South Dakota, yeah, look, at, yeah, way to go, recruiting office. Yeah, Augie. absolutely, they knew, they knew, and uh, you know, I came out here, took a look at it, and I fell in love with South Dakota, and uh, came to college here, spent four years at Augustana, uh, graduated with a degree in history and education, and uh, I've never left. Well, we're um, glad you're here, and we're yeah. glad you stayed. Yeah. Uh, South Dakota is my home, and it, it has a fascinating history, and it's, it's, uh, it's been good to me, and I hope I, I'm good to it. So Awesome. Well, one of my first opportunities or exposure to, to f- being familiar with what you do, uh, this would have been uh, ballpark time, 2014, 2015, something like that. Uh, you know, PBS, uh, they've got a lot of original – uh, documentaries and original shows on PBS, and I remember seeing uh, you were active in a uh, kind of a uh, excavation or something like that of a, a Fort James, which was a uh, you know a military fort over in the Mitchell area. And as I watched that show, you know John, he's from Huron, and I'm from Mitchell originally, and the James River runs between our two towns. And growing up in Mitchell, uh, I think back to uh, my education, I had no clue that Fort James even existed. So no. tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's a it's kind of it was an interesting uh, program to be a part of. It was called Time Team America, wow. and they went around to several different sites that, through archaeology, they were going to try to tell the story. And one of the one of these stories was Fort James. And um, Fort James is is interesting. And it, at the same time, I don't think that there's a lot of people that understand and know that we had a fort right here in, in what is now downtown Sioux Falls as well. But we're talking mid 1860s. Uh, you know, so you've got the early 1860s. You've got the Civil War raging uh, everywhere. It doesn't stop westward migration. You've got settlers still coming out here to the frontier. Uh, but what really kind of got people, a little, you know, pretty scared in the area was what's often called the, the Dakota conflict. Um, you know, even the Sioux uprising, as it was once known in 1862. And, pe- and people got really scared. They began to petition the government. We need we need some protection out here if we're going to be settlers out in this area. Uh, we need the military out here. Well, the military is in the midst of the Civil War. So it's really not until that gets wrapped up that uh, they start to establish these forts, um, some of them along the kind of the border between what is now South Dakota and Minnesota, but also along uh, the Missouri River. 
And one of those forts that was established was Fort James, uh, south of what it would be present-day Mitchell today. So, so it's like 10 miles southeast of Mitchell? Is yeah, that kind of yeah the right along there? the James River there. And, is there uh, anything there right now? Uh, no. <laughs> is there a historical, no. historical marker? Uh, there isn't a historical marker. Uh, the land is um, a part of a pasture for a Hutterite colony, mm-hmm. the Rockport Colony. Uh, and, uh, you know, what Time Team was doing is they were coming in there and they wanted to do some quick excavations. They do only do like a couple days worth of work there, see if they can tell the story within it. And they were trying to figure out what remains of, of the post. And what was interesting about that is they believe the post ha- had quite a few stone buildings. There's, there was building stone in the area and that they, they actually had stone foundations and stone buildings that they would be able to determine maybe what the layout of the fort was. One of the, one of the things from that show that I found very interesting was, you know, there's Sioux Quartzite deposits all over the, the region here, and uh, they did a demonstration where they basically took a slab of Sioux Quartzite and then scored it, and just a very simple little line, and then you break that, and it fractures. And Because uh, I often thought, you know, how did they build the uh, uh, courthouse here in town? How did they build some of these churches? You know, the Sioux Quartzite is a pretty heavy, dense material, but when you see how simple it is to score and fracture that, you can see the utility of that material for building, and that's one of the cool things from that show you guys did. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful building material, and everybody was trying to take advantage of that in the early days. So Fort James, they're, they're taking advantage of that. Even Fort Dakota here, they had stone buildings. Uh, you know, Several of their buildings were made of stone, and, and it was a great building material. Do we know uh, what happened to that stone when those buildings went away? They went. It, it went away to to who knows where. Repurposed, and maybe somewhere. Repurposed. It, it could be hauled away. Um, you know, there's there's some discussion whether Fort James may have been burned at at, at one point. Um, you know, it only lasted for a couple of years, and that's kind of the case for a lot of these forts, these smaller forts. Now, when I talk about Fort Dakota here in Sioux Falls, I mean like you need to get some of the old westerns, you know, from the 50s and 60s, get those out of your mind. I mean, <laughs> this was a, a series of buildings in the in the middle of the prairie. For a stockade, if you will, there was a three-foot high rail fence that went around the fort uh, to slow anybody down, you know, trying to approach the fort. Uh, but, uh, you know, these weren't tall stockades and such. And, and they used what they had. Uh, you know, many of them had sod roofs to them and, and, and things of that nature. So they were using the local building stone in order to build these places out here. One of the images that we'll put on, uh, on the Facebook page and uh, Instagram and what have you is you've got some very cool images of Fort Dakota that I've frankly never seen before. And, uh, you know, when you kind of orientate yourself from where the picture's taken to where they're looking, you can see the river in the background. You can kind of see where the, the falls would be. And, uh, you know, that area around 6th and Phillips, 8th uh, and Phillips in that area, that's where Fort Dakota was, and uh, that's where the city started. There's this, there's this and they, when you see the photo, too, there's this little path that's kind of, you can make out, you can see they were moving between their buildings, and that is going to one day become Phillips Avenue. I mean, that, that little dirt path. Uh, there, but looking at those pictures, the, the picture that we have that, that you're going to share um, was taken in the summer of 1866. And if you can imagine nothing going on in Sioux Falls in 1866, well, this this photograph will, will certainly show There's it. There's a lot going on. I think yeah. it's awesome. I mean, <laughs> but what's also interesting in the fact that the military owns all of this land. I mean, they have what they call a military reservation at that time, so they own what we would consider Sioux Falls today. So as settlers are starting to come in. The, th- the threat's kind of gone. Civil War's over. I want to come establish myself out in this area. And the military owns all these big swaths of land. And, you know, so really at Fort Dakota here, most of the time they're riding out of Fort Dakota because they're going to go kick some Norwegian settler off of his land, his land, their land. Mm-hmm. Uh, for it. And the Historical Society has done some great work. If you're ever driving down maybe Marion Road or on 57th Street, you'll see these signs. They're, they're yellow and they're brown and they say Fort Dakota Military Reservation. And those are marking the boundaries hmm. uh, right. of the reservation. And, and, I you wondered know. what that meant. Yeah. So, you know, they owned all that land. So as a settler, you couldn't come in. You couldn't stake a claim. You couldn't uh, say this is my 160 acres <laughs> uh, here, especially north of town. I mean, they're, they're going to own land uh, clear up near Renner oh, wow. uh, as well. So, you know, they, 
Uh, so several of these people, you know, they, they come in and, and they want to settle and they're like, nope, you got to get this out. Where you got to stop. So, you know, the fort was active from what, 1865 to about 1870. And then at the time in 1870, the government figured it's safe enough for people to settle without having the protection of the military. Is that the thought? Well, they had been, the settlers have been petitioning. We need help. We need help. We need help. So 65, they established Fort Dakota and they actually kind of say that no sooner did it get built than people are like, can you get rid of this thing? Now we <laughs> hey, it sounds like the government today. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need We're, that anymore. Yeah, yeah, we don't need that anymore. We're ready to come back. And, you know, so they did start petitioning. So 69, officially, they, they officially abandoned the post in 69. And then there was even controversy with that because now they've got all this land. The question is, you know, there's local people in the area. We want to settle on this. We want this to become our land. Mm -hmm. But the government's like, well, we could get rid of it back east. We've got all these big land speculators and such that we can get this land to. They can make big money. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a who you know kind of deal. Um, our Pettigrew's kind of in on this. He knows a guy. He's friends with a guy whose father was in Congress. And, you know, <laughs> so they do some finagling. But they actually get it so that this land is going to be dispersed uh, here um, in the area where we are. And uh, one of the big uh, names that, that took up land is a guy by the name of Dr. J.L. Phillips, Josiah Phillips. <laughs> and uh, he, he gets basically kind of the land between about 6th and 9th and what would be like Phillips in Minnesota today. And he starts laying out all these uh, this grid, and these are going to be streets, these are building blocks, and he starts selling land. So what was his background and experience? What he, was, he was a physician. He was a physician okay. who had come out to the area here, had served as a physician during the Civil War, comes out here with he and his wife, and, uh, you know, they, they make Sioux Falls their home. Um, unfortunately, he passes away pretty early in the history, but his wife... She stays out here. She runs the Phillips House Hotel, uh, which would be over uh, kind of on, on the East Bank area where the 8th and Railroad uh, <laughs> Center is there and that where that parking lot is there. That's, hmm. that's where the Phillips House Hotel was. Awesome. She builds a beautiful home overlooking Colvill Lake, mm -hmm. which in the early days she called it her summer home because she didn't think she could make it from Colvill Lake it was out in the country. to downtown. Yeah, I had to get away. Yeah, the roads weren't good enough uh, for her <laughs> and such. But it was, it was her estate that is Terrace Park now today. She made sure... That that uh, that that land made it into the hands of the city, so we could enjoy it today. So very cool. I know uh, uh, just the Josiah's, the uh, a restaurant downtown and the coffee shop. You know they've done a great job of just branding themselves in downtown with you know kind of a great ambiance and uh, historic pictures down there. I mean, it's just very cool. You can see what the family looked like, what uh, Josiah Phillips looked like, and uh, I just think it's a good way to to build a following is is make it accurate as possible. Absolutely, and, and yeah. memorialize who that person is. Yeah. Yeah, I you know, it, that's the thing. I think sometimes we live in our own community and we think you've got to travel long distances to have to, to find cool history. But really, we've got a cool history right here in our own backyard. Are, are there any other uh, people in that time period, you know, 1870 to by 1885, just random people that uh, not random, but historical uh, figures that are of interest that maybe have a similar story that people aren't familiar with? Well, I mean, all, all the kind of big names uh, that, that you hear uh, all the time. Of course, Senator Pettigrew, he comes early, you know, they're what I kind of call the founding fathers of the community. Uh, Charlie Howard, C.K. Howard, he comes and he owns the first general store here in Sioux Falls. And, and he's kind of he's kind of an interesting man, too, because he extended all sorts of credit. So you've got people coming out here. We've got grasshopper plagues. We've got prairie fires. People fall on hard times uh, out here. There's drought. And, you know, but he wants to see people succeed. And he extends all of this credit to people. And Many of them prosper. Some of them, they, they talk that the, some of these men that he helped by, uh, by giving, basically giving stuff away to became some of the most prosperous farmers mm -hmm. in Minnehaha County. Nice. And when he dies, he dies penniless. Right. Oh, no kidding. I, yeah. I've, read, I've read the same thing where he died penniless. And as a pauper, uh, I will give him credit, though. If you go to the, the uh, uh, cemetery there, kind of off, oh, what is it, 26th and Cliff, he's got one of the more impressive uh, gravestones or mausoleums yeah. or whatever the word is. Like a 30-foot obelisk uh right uh right near the Pettigrew mausoleum there on the, what's uh, called the rose hill section there of uh of uh, woodlawn cemetery yeah and you know some leading men went around yeah. and they you know were looking to they wanted to erect something maybe a statue they wanted some memory of ck howard even before he passed away they wanted 
uh, to collect some of this. And so they were going around, what can you give? And they had this stuff. And then he, he passes away, and they're like, how can we memorialize him? <laughs> and, you know, he didn't have anything, so they put this beautiful crazy? obelisk out, you know. So, you know, he's kind of a really neat character, you know. Um, he owns the Sutler store at Fort Dakota. So <laughs> he's got operations going in Sioux City. He makes contracts with the government to run the Sutler store at Fort Dakota. He's got this crazy guy named Ed Broughton. Mm -hmm. Um, Pettigrew described him, he called him a harem scarum product of the frontier. (laughs) (laughs) You know, just kind of this really weird and interesting guy um, who's running the Sutler store for for Howard up at, at Fort Dakota. Just. Uh, just some really neat characters uh, like that, you know, and sometimes you can just go around and all you have to do is read some street signs and, and there's streets named after some of these guys. So um, C.K. Howard, would the city, the town in South Dakota, Howard, South Dakota, would that be named after him? Boy, you know, or? I'm not sure about that one. I, I don't know if the if that uh, follows him or, or any something? connection to him uh, within that at all. Yeah, but, uh, you know, that. Big names, you know, a lot of times we get we get a school, we get a street named after some of these guys, you know. Well, the, I'll give you an example of just uh, Brookings, W.W. Uh, w. Brookings. You know, I was just driving near the cathedral the other day to the north, and there's a street called Brookings Street. I had no idea that there was a street called Brookings Street up there, but I knew that W.W. W. Brookings did live up there for a while and, um, you know, kind of give a history of uh, his connection. And he had an interesting nickname as well, correct? Well, I don't know if I've heard of his, his, uh, his nickname. You could share that one with me. Well, he uh, he fell through the ice. Fell through the ice. He was yeah. like Wooden Leg Brewing Company in Brookings is named after him. There you go. And I mean, if uh, I got a buddy who's left-handed, we call him Lefty. <laughs> well, if a guy has wooden legs, there's you got a yep. good nickname right yep. there. Uh, <laughs> wow. Had lots of frostbite. Had it, yeah. Had to have his uh, had his leg amputated. Absolutely. So, um, you know, yeah. Brookings, he's here very early. He's part of these speculative forces. I mean, you know, early on, kind of before we get things like the Homestead Act, where people can just come out and the government's giving away 160 acres of land and such. You've got these these groups of men that are getting together, they're pooling their money, they're securing large swaths of land, and then they're trying to plant these towns, they're trying to sell off farmland, and, and Brookings really gets involved in that in the 1850s. He gets involved with several of these these uh, kind of uh, deals where he, you know, people are coming out here to get these these lands. Um, he sees the fort. He he went when Fort Dakota gets established out here. He's talking to the to the military. He's talking to the government. He wants it put on his land. He's going to get compensated for it, okay. and he wanted it closer down near the falls. Um, but if you if you ever stand down next to the falls, about where the farmers market is mm-hmm. now, and you stand down there and you look around, think of how that would work as a fort. So you're going to put your down fort the down there in the bowl, yeah. right. and then you have nothing but these high bluffs that are ringing you uh, <laughs> around. I, bullets down on yeah. you. <laughs> Probably, probably not a good plan. Yeah, probably not the best plan. So the military said, no, I think we're going to move it a little further south. And that's where, you know, <laughs> where the fort ends up. W.W. W. Brookings' home, or one of his homes, is still north of the cathedral up there. And um, you know, I've driven by it, and I often wonder, does the person living there even realize the historical significance of that home? And frankly, that's one of the things why we're doing this podcast, is just to bring attention to local history and talk about what you specifically mentioned. There's a lot of great stuff right here in Sioux Falls. And uh, let's just kind of, kind of move on here a little bit. Uh, Late 1870s, early 1880s, the railroad started coming to Sioux Falls, you know, one line and then two lines. And eventually there became five lines that came through Sioux Falls to increase commerce. And, uh, you know, talk about some of the industries and businesses that were associated with that time period here in town. The railroad plays a major role in that. If your business, if your town is going to succeed in, in those days, it had to have a railroad connection. 1878, August 1st, 1878, first train steams into Sioux Falls, and Sioux Falls takes off uh, from there. The uh, Most of the accounts say that there were around 2,000, just over 2,000 people living in Sioux Falls around 1880. By 1890, there's just over 10,000 people uh, <laughs> living in the community. And you think about South, in South Dakota today. Think of the communities that don't have 10,000 people living in them. And by 1890, <laughs> Sioux Falls already had 10,000 people What was that living. first railroad line, and where did it come from? Did it come from Minneapolis, or did it come from Sioux City? Where it, It's coming east. Uh, it comes from the east, and it's rolling It's rolling into the to the community. Um, and so as, as it's making its way in, they're getting more and more excited as it's making its way through through Minnesota. And you can kind of see how the railroad goes, because you, you read some of the pioneer accounts, and 
you know, they've got their grain and such. First, they got to travel all the way to Worthington uh, mm -hmm. in order to, to sell their crop. And then you can tell that the railroad gets closer because now they're only going to Laverne uh, to, to sell their crop. And, and pretty soon here, we've got our railroad connections coming in. Here, here's a trivia question that I'll put you on the spot, and it'll be interesting to hear what your perspective is. But they put those stops uh, an X number of miles each town or each stop. Why did they do it the way they did it? Like, say it was eight miles or six miles or 12 miles. Why was, you know, Renner one stop and Colton was another stop? When they platted out those cities, why were they platted in that way by the railroad? I have absolutely no clue. I, I don't either, but I've heard, <laughs> I've heard reasons why they're the case. And if you think about it, uh, the original reason I heard was, well, they wanted to put these towns spread out so the farmers wouldn't have as far to go to bring their crops to town. Well, that makes sense, but at the end of the day, what does the railroad care about farmers and their feelings? I mean, there's functionality of these uh, locomotives, and the other theory I heard is that uh, the steam engines could only have so much water that they could heat up. So as that steam went, that was their power source. When the steam was gone, the water was gone, they had to stop. So some of the older trains, like if you look at maps of Iowa and some of the development in the railroad in those areas, those towns are about six miles apart on average, and they're just a lot closer together so as these steam engines got better and better they were able to spread the towns out further and further as westward expansion occurred now that makes more sense to me is it exactly right it's probably a little bit of truth a little bit of fiction but at the end of the day that makes more sense to me than saying hey we want to make sure that we treat these farmers right and they don't have to come very far Absolutely. So I, I would go with the water. I would go with the water thing. I, I could really uh, get behind that one a little yeah. bit. Uh, that uh, you there's only so much water. gas in the tank. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that would also make sense. Why uh, the further west you go, the further apart they are, because the technology is better and they can go further. So that makes sense to me. Well, it's one of those things where if you sound really important and you talk like you know what you're talking about, people are going to believe you, <laughs> whether it's true or not. Here we are. That's why we're talking. I was going to say some of the railroad guys are going to be out there. They're going to see this, and they're going to. I would gonna, love to have them, comment. you know, contact us and say, "Yep, you're right on the money." Or, "Oh man, that's the biggest bunch of." Uh, uh, <laughs> but either way, let's talk about it. So, but yeah, just from an industry standpoint, that the railroad brought to town kind of speak to some of the the, the spinoffs of what that stimulated. The railroad becomes so important, and I think uh, some of the areas, you actually get industrial areas of Sioux Falls. And uh, at the museum, I'm going to do a shameless plug for the for the Pettigrew Museum right now, is we have an exhibit that we just opened on, e on South Sioux Falls. And South Sioux Falls was an industrial area. Now, by South Sioux Falls, I'm talking just south of 41st Street, uh, kind of coming anywhere from about Minnesota Avenue and coming all along that southern uh, border, coming up uh, even to where the, the 26th Street interchanges with I-29. That was South Sioux Falls, and it was all platted as just an industrial area. Like what years are we talking there? We're talking by, by 1888, 89, mm. this is getting uh, started, and we're talking about soap factory, axle grease factory, chain and mortise works. Um, so this is, I'm like, these are factories, mm. uh, a starch mill. Are any um, of these buildings still around? Absolutely not, no. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <Yeah. laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> advance uh, progress, wipe them out put up augie or something like yeah, that. yeah you know so yeah a lot of it a lot of it's gone today but uh one that people will actually maybe remember a little bit um is uh, there was a uh, there was a packing plant uh that was built it was completely built of quartzite stone i mean it was huge and um in, and it was torn down in the 40s. Uh, they they tore it down. But they kept a lot of the stone and they used it around town. So some of the work that was done at the falls is some of the stone here. Uh, I've always been told that if you go to the zoo today and there's the mountain goat uh, exhibit and there's all these really? uh, quartzite that. Uh, slabs that are all there, mm. those are all from the old packing uh, uh, plant. Cool. And we have the cornerstone to it uh, with its day is sitting right out and in front of the Pedigree Museum. in South Sioux Falls? Uh, right about where kind of Home Depot, Slumberland, and over to like where the theater is today. That that was where the the packing plant was located mm. uh, at that time. Didn't run very successfully though. That was that was one of its big issues. You know, there's a, there's a marker downtown where it talks about the cigar industry in Sioux Falls, and we've had Bob Colby on the show and Wayne Fanaboost before, but we never talked about the the cigar industry with those two guys. Can you kind of hit on that in that well, time period? And it sounds kind of weird, but I mean, literally, we do we have a cigar industry. There there are you know five and ten cent cigars. 
cars and they're, you know, they bring in the people who knew how to roll them and uh, they, they rolled cigars in kind of the area we're talking about, Phillips Avenue, kind of between 8th and 9th streets right down there. There was an area where there was kind of this little cigar industry going So was on. there tobacco grown here locally or were they shipping it in? Most of the tobacco was shipped in, yeah. From from what I understand, most of the, the tobacco was, was shipped into the area and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, but uh, they would bring in, they would bring in people who knew how to roll cigars and you could get your local cigar all right here in sioux falls i'll have a cuban or i'll have a minihaha well, I, I prefer the cuban <laughs> you know that's awesome <laughs> and there's there's one other industry that uh really is interesting to me is that you just never know what form or shape commerce is going to take in a free market there's certain things that pop up that uh, there's just opportunity and certain industries take advantage of that opportunity and uh, we talked about it earlier before the show you know there was a time when sioux falls was known as the divorce capital of the united states or what was the exact title divorce capital divorce colony divorce capital of the u.s absolutely they called us the reno nevada of of the the country at the time and it had to do with our lenient residency laws and divorce laws here um you could claim um a divorce in the area through several different things abandonment excessive cruelty excessive drunkenness adultery um you know Things that certainly lead to divorce today. So, so was, that, was that time period like a, a kind of a vestige of the Dakota Territory Charter that wasn't converted in the Constitution when they formed the state? How did that loophole not get filled when it a little bit, a little bit of that? Yes, it, it's kind of a holdover from territorial days, and uh, with those residency laws, uh, it started out as ninety days to become a resident, and you could uh, you could get your divorce. How did that compare to like people in Pennsylvania? What was the uh, you well, well in many of those cases divorce was unheard of there. You couldn't you couldn't get one either. They didn't have the as many the easy enough rules uh, under their their states. Uh, they had you know it, it pretty extreme laws in order to be able to get a divorce. So uh, here it is. We've we've got a series of categories in which to get a divorce, and you could become a resident of the state first at ninety days, then it gets up to six months. So if you can imagine, you're going to move somewhere for six months, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> what, was the, what was the definition of residency? Your, in, your intent to become a South Dakota resident, uh, you know, and so uh, you come in and declare that, that, uh, that I live here. So that's the thing. You can't just say, I'm declaring I'm, I'm going to be there. You had to live here. I mean, you had to physically be here. You had to the, in... physically be here. So uh, it didn't necessarily mean that you had to buy a house, but so you could be living in a hotel for six months. You could, you could live. Uh, you, could, you could rent a house. You could buy a house. So were there people specifically setting up rentals just for that? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. They're, they're setting up rentals. People are, you know, this becomes, uh, it becomes a big issue in the community because you've got all these people coming in. So um, these are, these people who are looking to get a divorce too, many of them are quite wealthy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they've now come, I've got to spend the next six months here. Well, I like to eat. uh, So they wanted fine dining. I like to shop, so I, you know, I want I want good stores, uh, I want excursions, I want entertainment. Um, so, from the business standpoint of the community, this was great, uh, you know. So uh, we're seeing a big push by the local businesses. They're they're like the lawyers love this as well. <laughs> You've got young lawyers who are just getting started out. I'm going to specialize in divorce uh, within this. So this is great now. The clergy in town had a different view yeah, on, on it. Not big um, fans. Not very big fans of that this is what Sioux Falls is being noted for. You have people like Bishop uh, Hare, um, who's here in town, and, and he does not see what a great thing this is for our community. Mm-hmm. And there's lots of t- attempts to, to change the laws uh, on this. Um, and it's not going to change until 1908. So you've got kind of that period through the 1890s and just past the turn of the century that that people so, are so coming the law, here. Law was changed at a local level, state level, state federal level. level. Yep, it gets changed at a state level, um, and they change that uh, residency up to a year, which is then going to put us past places like Reno, Nevada. Okay, um, and uh, so. Um, so yeah, our laws change, and the the divorce colony kind of sinks kind into of history. A question: um, How did people hear about that? Because is there any historical record of you know were, were there you know 
businesses that, that placed ads in the Chicago newspaper or maybe the Philadelphia newspaper. I mean, if you're getting these wealthy people that come out here from the East Coast, there's got to be a way to hook them and bring them here. Any any information yeah, on that? I don't really know how they heard about this, but I'm sure it's word of mouth. And believe me, this isn't something that isn't written about. It isn't it isn't kept, you know, uh, hush hush in the community. I mean, front page of the Argus leaders, you can read, you know, about what's going on with such and such as divorce Mm -hmm. uh, with this. So this is big news. And, and this would have been probably picked up just like, you know, news from any, you know, community is in the country. So I am sure that people heard about this. Especially if they were really wealthy people that were doing it. I'm sure they, they were also, I want out of this deal. Yes. (laughs) You know, within the social circles. And I mean, I was just reading one case where this woman was wanted to divorce her husband. Uh, she she accused him he of adultery, um, of physical abuse, and uh, he wanted to divorce. She wanted a divorce, so um, she talked with him and said, uh, "I'm going to take the kids and we're going to go to a resort area for the summer." Uh, they were from Long Island, uh, New York. And so he said, okay, but I want, I want a daily letter letting me know how you're doing, how the kids are doing and such. So she goes to the resort. She buys about a hundred postcards, <laughs> dates them all, writes them out. Kids are doing fine. We're all doing great and such. And then she pays somebody to mail one of these every day. And once she gets that set up, she comes out here to start her residency. So oh. at that time she needed the 90 days. So she's starting her residency out here. He catches on uh, after a while, and uh, he follows her out here. Uh, divorce gets written up, and, and their divorce is finally granted uh, at that. But, uh, you know, all of the things she was uh, accusing him of, he then turned around and accused her of. And, <laughs> you know, I, so this is kind of sensational journalism for the time, too. So, you know, mm. and, and there's big names. Uh, one that's kind of interesting one of the Woolworths came here and got his divorce. Five and dime stores? Yeah. And, you know— it's actually the cousin to the to F. W. Woolworth, who who is the big five and dime uh, store. But this this guy is a cousin, and he tries to set up his own five and dime and actually compete with his cousin. And you know, F. W. He, and he's got a good business going, and you know, he doesn't mind the competition. He likes a little competition. He starts to get a little angry though when this cousin starts using his same color scheme and the same setups in his store, oh, yeah. even kind of branding his ads and his, you know, and, and his stores just like uh, his cousins. And so um, when, when uh, his cousin kind of falls into uh, some financial trouble, he doesn't bail him out. He lets him go bankrupt, and then he, then he absorbs him and, and takes him in. But they talk about how his, his branch, the, this H.G. Woolworth, you know, his branch, for a while, he's here. His residency is here, so he is the the national headquarters awesome. of, of Woolworths. But it's you know not the Woolworths necessarily that we. What know. What was the name of his store? Was it? A- it was Woolworths? Yeah, HG they Wool- yeah, Woolworths. They were both Woolworths. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. So then, in eighteen oh, excuse me, nineteen oh eight, that law changes, and the the state requires things to be on a level playing field with other states, and yep. that industry just kind of went away with the wind. Yep, and it. Yep, uh, we're we're getting up there now. We have that year residency. Now there's new areas, more frontier area, you know, places even further west where, you know, so uh, so that kind of goes away, yeah, uh, from us. And, you know, it's it's an interesting time in our in our history, and it's one that uh, gets forgotten. Well, one of the well. one of the other industries that you look at that early 1900 time period there, you had the you had the tractor manufacturers in in, in Iowa, you know, uh, John Deere and Waterloo Tractor Company, and and different things in Michigan with Ford and the development of the auto industry in that area. Uh, there's an industry in Sioux Falls that if things would have gone a different route, you know, I'm not saying Sioux Falls would have been the Detroit of the U.S., but there was a local potential auto manufacturer here in town that some people know enough to. To be dangerous, uh, but the story of Thomas Faywick and what he's done here locally, or almost did here locally, is an incredible story. Thomas Faywick is an amazing man. He, I, I was, you know, you read up on him and, and you read a little bit more, and I'm fascinated every time I learn more about this guy. He's he's one of those people when he saw a machine. You know, he didn't say, oh, that's cool and everything. I want to take it apart. I want to see how it works. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of mind he has. And I think we all know one of those type of people that, you know, they can just look at something. They they can just see how it works. And they went, you know. Different. 
different. Yeah. yeah. And they, they think they can also make it better. You know, in, in my mind, when I think of Thomas Fawick, he was a, you know, 17, 18 year old kid in 1908, that time period there. I mean, he was almost like Sioux Falls as Elon Musk. You know, that's how I think of him. Yeah, I, absolutely. And, you know, and it's, it's amazing. It's too bad that he did move away from Sioux Falls. His family's here. But a 14-year-old boy, the Fawick family, they're building a new house. And they're, they're having the plumbing done in the house. And the plumber they hire just doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> and so finally, they get so upset with it that they finally fire the plumber. And she says, I'm going to have my 14-year-old son plumb the house. <laughs> and Thomas Fabic plums their house. And the plumber comes back. And he goes, well, I want to see what this kid did. And he's like, this is fantastic. He offers him a job right there because uh, this kid can, can plumb the whole house. So here's and, a question for you. The uh, 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 home of Thomas Fawick or the, the manufacturing facility of Thomas Fawick is still actually on West 13th Street in Sioux Falls. So is the house you're talking about, is that next yeah, door? That, yeah, next door. Yeah. And that's uh, on, on 13th Street there. That's that's where the Fawick home was. So hmm. yeah, that's the one he, he, he did all the plumbing for uh, at the time. But so, you know, of course, the big thing, cars are, are making the deal, you know, that they're, they're making their, they're coming, you know, got Ford, who's making, making cars at, at the time. And, you know, uh, so he starts to tinker a little bit with this and <laughs> he comes up with his own ideas. He has his first, it's a, you know, a two cylinder engine in what he calls his silent Sioux. And uh, the histories are great because they said there was nothing silent about it <laughs> uh, when it ran. But, you know, he thought then he could he could make something better. And so he made a, a four cylinder car. And, uh, you know, the the engine was manufactured for him, but to his specifications and things like that. But he builds it right here in, in Sioux Falls. And and he, you know, he names it his Fawick Flyer. Mm-hmm. Got, to name a, it, got to name it after yourself. That's right. It's a, a Ford's Model T. Yeah. Not, not something else. But, you know, that time period there, there's a famous picture, several famous pictures, actually, or well-known pictures that were taken of uh, Teddy Roosevelt as he would campaign for his uh, presidency camp- coming through Sioux Falls. And he's in the Fawick Flyer. Absolutely. And that Fawick Flyer was owned by Rush Brown. Rush Brown bought his third car that he built here. So we got the Silent Sioux. We've got this this first uh, Fawick Flyer uh, that, that Thomas Fawick builds. That's the one that's at the old courthouse museum that you can come and see. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he's, he builds this third one. He does a couple of modifications on this third one, too. He puts four doors on it. Mm. Up to that point, no four-door cars out there. He's credited with perhaps building the first four-door car uh, in the country. And, uh, and Rush Brown buys it. He, he doesn't even know. He, he even says, why, why has this thing got four doors on it? Why like, not? Who, who even needs that and everything? Rush Brown paid $3,000 uh, for that car. Well, um, kind of get back to my, my point about Elon Musk and, you know, what he's doing with his Tesla vehicles. You know, at that time, eight, 1907, 1910, a Model T, you know, they came out in 07 and they were made until about 1926. But those first three, four years there, a Model T retailed, you know, 600 to $900, whereas the Faywick Flyer, this gentleman paid $3,000 for it. $3,000 in 1910 is about $70,000 today. So pretty much right, you know, similar to like a Tesla. So it's kind of funny from that standpoint. But you got me curious who was this rush brown he um they own a pharmacy here in town okay. uh, brown drug and uh you know so uh they're doing okay uh, they're doing okay for themselves so you know rush brown he's a young guy he's a friend of the you know so mm. you know thomas Fabic sells his buddy uh a car and rush brown talks about how he's out for a drive one day in this and you know there's no speedometer in this car uh you know he knows it can in, do a fair clip and he kind of gets on a on a straightaway and there's a, there's a set of railroad tracks that are running by the road, and a train comes up. Wow. And so he's he's going to keep pace with the train. And, and so um, he says for about 10 miles, he kept pace uh, right there with that engine. You know, even so he waved to the engineer a couple times. And uh, so the train stops to take on water. As uh, we talked earlier. Yeah, hey, all right. right. Yeah. Maybe it's true. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Now he says he went about ten miles. So let's let's okay. uh, so we'll see where, but uh, you know so 
he pulls in, you know, the train taking out. He talks to the engineer. He's like, you know, and the engineer's impressed. He goes, boy, he goes, we get a lot of people in these new cars that, that try to keep up with it. And, and none can keep up, but, but yours did. And he goes, well, well, what was I doing? He goes, you were doing 70 miles an hour. I love it. Uh, on that. And well, good you know, perspective, how fast were Model T's at that time? And I know there's laws out there that had speed limits here in Sioux Falls. They were nowhere near 70 miles an hour. If you were driving in downtown Sioux Falls at that time, when, when cars start to, to become a thing on the streets, they start regulating it. There is a speed limit in downtown Sioux Falls. It is seven miles per hour. <laughs> All right? Four miles per hour if you're turning the corner. Safety first. Safety first. Don't bump anybody off trying to cross the street down there. So Can you even imagine that. <laughs> yes. So, you know. Very, very far advanced from the contemporary automobiles that were out there. And really, as I hear you talk, I, probably the biggest minimal, minimizing factor was the quality of the roads. Yeah. I mean, you're going 60 miles an hour on a, a road that's full of potholes. You're going to be a bumpy ride, and it's not very safe. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, and that's the thing. I, the, the roads themselves just couldn't, couldn't handle uh, what this what this car could do, but uh, so this is fascinating. He he you know he makes a few of these cars. He does you know um, the number is kind of there's there's some different sources. There historians pretty much agree he never made more than about twelve of these cars ever. And to our knowledge, the one that we have at the old courthouse museum is the only uh, Fabic flyer that's still. Where did existence. that one come from? You've got me curious because that's probably got a, a provenance or story of its own. That was Thomas Fabic himself. Oh, was his personal. Uh, that model. was his personal. That was the second one he built. He uh, had it in Sioux Falls, stored in his brother's garage. Um, Thomas Fabic ended up going to Ohio. Um, and, uh, so in the 1950s, he told his brother, I want you to pull that, that car out. I goes, I want you to get it roadworthy again. At that time, he thought that that car had probably done about 125,000 miles in its life. Oh, really? And, wow. uh, you know, had it all, all restored. And then he had it shipped, uh, out to where he was running his own little museum in, in Ohio with all of the stuff that he had. And so that was Thomas Fabick's personal Fabick flyer that he then later, Donated to Augustana College, who then donated it to the museum. <laughs> you know, you, you've got me curious. If you're 18 years old, you've got a lot of knowledge, you've got a lot of chutzpah, you've got a lot of guts, but you don't have the financial backing to make these things happen. Did he just not have the business plan to put together to get financed, or there just wasn't enough money out here? Because previously we talked about the uh, financing of the uh, uh, Queen Bee Mill down near the falls, and that was financed by essentially uh, an investment firm or investment banker from New York. Uh, had $200,000 be infused into Faywick at that time? Who knows what would have happened? Is, is our my perspective on that accurate? I think a little bit. I think it does have to do with money, but I think it also has to do a little bit with Thomas Faywick. He's, you know, the more you read about him, the more you see that I think he gets started in something, and he does it for two, three years, mm. but then he sees something new, something better out there. So he moves to his next project mm. uh, all of the time. Interesting. Because after, you know, kind of after the cars, he goes into tractors. He moves to Waterloo, Iowa, mm. and, uh, you know, there's a friend there who's got a machine shop and such, and he starts, he's like, well, maybe I can make tractors better. Uh, so he starts working in tractors. Uh, and, uh, he has this tractor and it's, it's got this screw drive to it. He thinks he can speed up tractors. He watches these, these early tractors kind of plot at one or two miles an hour through the fields and stuff. And he's like, I can improve that. And, and he goes, they need a better clutch. I can improve that as well. So <laughs> he builds this better clutch. He gets this kind of screw drive and, you know, and Ford himself says, guys have tried this. You know, you, you aren't going to go anywhere with it and everything like that. But, you know, he builds two, uh, two tractors and uh, he's testing them. And he notices these guys at the edge of the field. And they're, um, they're British emissaries who are here looking for tractors. Mm. Uh, and they're looking for a good tractor. Uh, it's kind of the time of World War I. They need to, to maximize their agriculture at the time. And uh, they're like, can we buy one of your tractors? We want to test it. And he sells them the tractor. They ship it to New York. And then it gets on a boat, goes over to England, wins first place. Mm. And they want to buy over a million dollars worth of these tractors <laughs> uh, at the time. And, he's, and he sends it on to somebody else. He gives, the, he gives the contract to his buddy who had the machine shop. He's like, well, you've got... You've got the factory to make them. You got everything. Here's my design. So he's just an engineer at like the Waterloo Tractor he, Company and says, "Hey, here you go. Here you go. Here you wow. go. There you there you are." And uh, some of the stuff that he showed Ford, 
He showed Ford some plans at different times. And Ford, of course, develops a tractor as well. And some of some of his technology that Faywick did actually ends up in Ford's tractors. So, so he, he made his way to uh, Cleveland. And then during World War II, he had some uh, uh, patents and inventions. He had and patents and clutches he, with the U.S. military for landing craft uh, that the Navy was using. And, and so he uh, – he, Comes up with some things on some motors for that, um, you know. So he amasses some some great wealth from all of these patents that he has and and these inventions. Uh, if we got any golfers out there, you can thank Thomas Fawick for that as well. He patented rubber grips for golf clubs. Really, awesome. Um, he was out golfing. Said his hands just got fatigued all the time from you know hitting this There's ball. There's a better way. There's a better way. They, you know, they were just sometimes leather wrapped or kind of a tape wrap, and it's like you know. Too much vibration he was getting into his hands, so he started doing rubber grips. And from from golf clubs, it went on to some tennis rackets and other things like that. So he kind of patented those. Mm. He was a musician. Um, he wanted to make the perfect violin. He wanted to make a violin that would uh, rival a Stradivarius. <laughs> and uh, he, he bought a Stradivarius. Of course, you can do that when you've got all these patents. And, and he examined it, and he tried to build an instrument that, that could rival the Stradivarius and came up with his own violin that he had some of the foremost violin players in the, in the world play his violin. And he said sounds it like great. a guy, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's all awesome, but it's a, uh, the, the uh, knowledge base is wide and deep. And deep, yes. <laughs> you know, composed music like nobody's business. I mean, so it's just one of those minds, you know. Mm. Uh, every generation has one of those kind of guys that, that has just that mind. Well, hopefully Sioux Falls has about 10 of these yeah. uh, people coming through the school system here locally. And, you know, as he got later on in his life, you know, he came back to Sioux Falls and it was a, he was older, more established, and it was time to give back to the community. You talked about the uh, uh, Faywick flyer that he gave to the local museum, but he also gave uh, several things to Augustana and then to the city as well. He has some pieces of art, and uh, you know, today you can go down to Faywick Park, and uh, there's a replica of the Statue of David uh, that you would find in Italy. Only a few of those in the world. Only a few of those in the world. And uh, he got he worked with the Italian government. Mm. He worked with uh, the the sculptor that he worked with is the same gentleman who did the uh, the raising of the flag at Iwo Jima that is in Washington mm. D.C. I mean, so I mean, he's he's the got big deal. names. And he works, and he gets this this uh, exact replica of the the statue of David, and uh, and gives it to the city. Now, there's controversy. Yeah, that's a story <laughs> itself. <laughs> that's a story unto itself. I wonder why. So you know, you get this this wonderful gift to you, and you 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 know want to put it on public display. But at that time, you know, where do you put a giant statue of a naked man uh, in town? And it caused a lot of controversy, um, you know, and, and some people said that, you know, the, this would be shameful for us to display this. And I think one of the quotes from one of the local clergymen was, there are going to be naked men running in the streets, <laughs> which, really? yeah, I mean, it was, pre- it was pretty intense, the, uh, the opposition. <laughs> Maybe, but I haven't seen it, thankfully. <laughs> uh, and, you know, they turned him, so he kind of mooned the city. That's what, you know, uh, at one point. But, uh, you know, about 15 years ago or so, 15, 20 years ago, the, the city had to redo some work in Fabic Park. They had to do some cleanup because that site at one point was part of where the coal gasification plant was here that made get the gas lighting. I made the gas for the gas lighting here in town. And there was some old coal tar and stuff, so they had to – take David out, and, and they redid Faywick Park, and, and there was even some question as to whether David was going to come back to the park. But, mm-hmm. but he did, and he's there today, and, and you know, it's, it's actually uh, quite a deal for, for Sioux Falls to have this in its community. Fit him for a nice pair of pants. Yes, yeah, well, absolutely. Let's, uh, let's not try to get that started. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question of whether a fig leaf should be put on the statue at one There's point. There's always so. options, but one option is to just leave it be. Yeah. yeah, maybe that's the best one. But you know, Kevin, I appreciate you, you coming in, and you know, we'll probably have you on on the podcast again. We'd love to have you. You know, the whole purpose of what we're doing with Sioux Falls Connected as a whole, with our mobile platforms, and then with the content that we put on the platform, is to just let people know about you know who's in the community, uh, what's the community about, give it an opportunity for people to connect and learn more about you know who we are and the history of Sioux Falls is a big part of that. And I want to say thank you to John for hosting this once again. Yeah. And uh, you know, if there's ever a topic that you want to bring up in the future don't hesitate to contact me and that frankly goes for everybody that listens to the show you know contact us through our uh, Sioux Falls Connected Facebook page or send us a message on the Sioux Falls Connected app which you can download in the uh, uh, app store or in Google Play and uh, you know we'll build this thing together and just have a, a great time doing it 
Absolutely. You've been listening to Our People, Our Story, a Sioux Falls Connected podcast. Again, thank you to Kevin Gans, and he's been our guest from the Old Courthouse Museum. Also, thank you to Garrett Gross from Sioux Falls Connected. I'm John Small from Sunny Radio. Thank you so much for joining us.